Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about the functions of, and the roles of joints and articulations. Yeah, that's right. This is going to be a discussion, and I hope an interesting one, I might add. This is going to be a discussion about the role of joints, their function, uh, their structure, and of course it's going to be a conversation about movements because movement occurs about the joint. And so if that's mysterious or intriguing, this is the point of the video. So let's just get right into that. So let me define a few things that you may be aware of, like the, the concept of articulation. Uh, usually when you think of articulation, you think of a person who comes to the point or they're very articulate. Well, this, this is where two bones come together or come to a point or, or a junction, if you will. It's the place in which bones come into contact and those are called articulations and so you can see here in the classic joint of the knee where you could see the femur or thigh bone articulating with the tibia and fibula and then here's the kneecap or patella so a joint is where bones come together now movement occurs at the joint or these articulations when muscles contract across the joint moving one bone closer to another now, that may be clear, may not be clear. And so if you don't mind, I would like to elaborate on that. And so here is your classic elbow joint where you can see your humerus uh, articulating with the ulna and radius, which are in your forearm, okay? So skeletal muscle is attached, as you can see here in the biceps brachii. It's attached to the bone via tendons, okay? And it's attached. And so when a muscle contracts or shortens, uh, they extend force by, by pulling, uh, which helps us move. And so, for example, when the forearm flexes is an example of that kind of movement. Okay. Now, ligaments are areas of fibrous connective tissue that attach bones to bones, and tendons attach, attach muscles uh, around a joint and, the, and, the, and to the bone. Like, for example, in the biceps, I was mentioning before, this tendon attaches to the radius over here at the, the radial tuberosity in particular, right over here, there's an attachment. So you got tendons here and ligaments supporting and holding the joint together. So in most ca cases, one end of the muscle is fixed and the other one is going to move during contraction. And so let's get a few important terms out. So the origin right here, the origin is the attachment site. Like for example, again, with the, the biceps brachii, the attachment is to the scapula and that's the part that's not moving during contraction, the origin where it's attaching, it's not moving. But the insertion, as I was mentioning before, the radial tuberosity, this part does move. And so when the muscle contracts, this is what causes the forearm to flex in an upward direction right there. Okay, and that's around the elbow joint. And so the insertion is usually, not always, but usually distal, meaning further away from the, uh, from the core of the body. And the origin's usually proximal, as you can see, it's attached to the scapula here. Okay, so when it contracts, uh, it causes movement about the joint, across the joint. So let's talk about these joints. And so one thing that I wanna say, and uh, part of this video is is uh, talking about motion and the range of motion. And so that's uh, where we're going with this. But I wanted to point out one important principle that I think is a is a through line uh, that, that that's a come away uh, from the video. And I hope I hope you uh, can appreciate this, that the strength of the joint decreases as mobility increases. So keep that in mind throughout our conversation. And so you might think of one of the most mobile joints is the shoulder joint, which allows us so much mobility, but it, but it also doesn't have that much strength and it can become dis, uh, dislocated, et cetera. But there's other joints that are very strong that don't have a lot of mobility. So keep that in mind. So we usually like to classify our joints in two ways, functionally, which is based on the range of motion of the joint, or basically in, in simple terms, we like to classify the joint based on what it does. So what, the, what does the joint do? And then structurally, like what classifies it in terms of anatomically, what is the joint made up of? And there's different kinds. And so we're gonna take a look at those things. And then we can also uh, look at this. We could say functionally, 
in terms of classification, you know, what the joint does or how much can it move, there's three basic criteria here. There's immovable joints, there's slightly movable ones, and freely movable ones. So immovable are sin arthrosis, ampiarthrosis, and diarthrosis. So we're going to take a look at those and examples of those. So immovable, slightly movable, and then freely movable. Okay. So you might have guessed the shoulder is a diarthrosis because it's it's freely movable. So what kinds of materials hold bones together? Uh, this will come up as well. There's there's bones are held together bone by bones uh, by fibrous tissue, uh, cartilaginous tissue, and synovial. Uh, and so these types of interactions are going to be part of our discussion as well as well and so let's take a look at these immovable joints right out of the gate and so we have these, these are again called synarthrosis they're very strong so again strength but yet not not mobile so this is an example of this are the sutures of the skull if you're familiar with this where uh, the 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 flat plates of the parietal bones come together here in the sagittal suture, and then there's the lambdoid suture right here. The bones may uh, touch each other and interlock, and so sutures are an example of that. Uh, they're found, uh, they're bound by these dense fibrous connective tissue sort of right in between the bones, and it's found only in the skull. And so we can see here is the um, uh, examples of the squamous suture right here, which separates the parietal and the temporal bone right over here. And there's the lambdoid suture and the coronal suture, which separates the frontal bone. So sutures are an example of Im immovable joints. Now, synchondrosis are examples of immovable joints as well. And those are the, the cartilage, the bridge, if you will, uh, that uh, is the attachment point between ribs and the sternum. You can see here is the first rib attaching to the manubrium of the sternum right here. So that right there where these two bones come together and there's a cartilaginous ridge, that's an example of an immovable joint as well. Now you have these ampiarthroses and these are a little bit more movable uh, and, they're, and uh, they're, more, they're stronger than the completely movable joints. But Okay, so there's two types of ampiarthrosis. And so one down here is um, symphysis. And so you might be familiar with uh, the, where the two pubic bones uh, articulate. There's a pubic synthesis right here. So there's a, there's a, uh, it's a connection uh, of fibrocartilage in here. And that's slightly movable, which is uh, pretty important when it comes to uh, labor and delivery of a baby if this is the female pelvis. Okay. And then you have uh, also examples of this, the intervertebral discs, which separate the vertebrae from one another. And those are um, important, slightly movable, but yet very strong. And then there's the syndymosis. Uh, and these are where bones come together, like for example, here's your tibia and fibula in, in the lower leg. And simply where two bones are articulating, there's, car there's a... a there's a ligament bridge which connects the bones, and that's an example of an ampiarthrosis joint. Okay, and then these joints right here, these synovial joints or diarthrosis, are uh, some of the more common joints of the body, and they're basically at the ends of long bones. And so, where where long bones come together, are where they articulate. It's usually within uh, an articular capsule, and that's what this is, a capsule between the two bones. And that is enclosed by ligaments, and inside the, uh, the, this capsule is what's known as a synovial membrane. Okay, you can see it right here, it's a synovial membrane, and you're like, what is that? What's that going to do? Well, here we go with synovial joints, most important. So uh, basically, in since these are highly movable, uh, you can imagine bones coming together, crashing together, jumping, running, throwing. Uh, it creates a lot of friction, okay? And so you want to make sure that that friction isn't going to be causing damage to the bones over the course of a lifetime. And so what happens is that the ends of the bones are coated by cartilage. It's usually a type of cartilage called hyaline, if you're familiar with that. And it's referred also as, sorry about that, but it's articular 
cartilage because it's at the end of the bone where the bones are articulating with one another. Okay, and so these articular cartilages prevent the bones from actually touching with one another and they're smooth and they're lubricated. This is very important. They're lubricated by synovial fluid that is secreted by the synovial membrane, which is composed of fibroblast cells. So this reduces friction. So let's talk a little bit about synovial fluid. So synovial fluid contains these sort of, if you will, egg-like, egg-white-like molecules called proteoglycans. And so you have this, I won't get into the biochemistry of it, but, but it is pretty cool. I welcome you to take a look on the internet and take a look at some of the structures in more detail. But basically it's a protein core with, with feather-like extensions of, of glycoproteins coming off to the side. And so this together uh, makes up this sort of uh, viscous um, egg white material, which provides lubrication at the joint. It, it's, it's, um, it also distributes nutrients uh, to the surrounding tissue and it's a shock absorber. Uh, absorber. And so it's really important uh, to be present in the in the joint capsule, okay? And in addition to the synovial fluid, we have accessory structures that help uh, prevent troubles when it comes to bones uh, articulating in, uh, in the synovial joint. You might be familiar with this. This is a classic where the thigh bone or femur comes in and articulates with the tibia and fibula, i.e. the knee. So the knee takes a lot of um, uh, abuse, if you will. And so in addition to the articular cartilage, which is at the ends of the bones, there's an additional fibrocartilage pad called the meniscus or menisci for plural. We have a, a, a medial and a lateral menisci, which are C-shaped cartilaginous rings, which in, in, increase the shock absorption that occurs at the knee joint. Th those are really important. And you might be familiar with this. We also have uh, superficially inside a, a the, the joint capsule, if you will, this is the acetabulum of the pelvis. This is where your femur is articulating with the pelvis, the head of the femur, I should say. This is an example, you know, foreshadowing here, spoiler alert, ball and socket joint. But inside the acetabulum is a fat pad. Yeah, that's right. And that helps to protect the cartilage as well. So this is uh, something that uh, is in addition and so you, you would expect it to find this in the knee as well, and you would, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the ligaments. I mentioned ligaments are helping to connect bones to bones uh, at the joint, holding the bones together. And so they help to support, they help to strengthen the joint, but there can be injury. And so I wanna bring that up because this is kind of a common thing. Like when most people think of their ligaments, <laughs> they're they're only thinking about them when there's an injury, like for example, a sprain, and then suddenly it comes to mind, and it's like now everyone wants to know about ligaments when there's a sprain. Now, what is a sprain? Well, sprains are could be stretches or tears in the in the cartilaginous. No, I'm sorry, the the collagen. I don't mean ca cartilage, collagen fibers in the fibrous connective tissue that makes up a ligament. So let's look at that. You might have heard of this before. There's a first degree. Uh, sprain, which is basically the stretching of the ligament. And symptoms of that are you know, mild pain, that's relative, it could be a little bit more, some swelling, uh, and again, uncomfortable. <laughs> but then second degree is a partial tear, as opposed to a complete tear. So second degree sp sprain is a partial tear in the ligament, and that's a lot of swelling, maybe even some bruising. Um, and moderate to severe pain, and, you, and you're starting to lose uh, the ability to walk at that point. <laughs> and then third degree is most severe sprain, as it implies, it's the third degree of it, and it's a complete tear of the ligament. So it's severe swelling, um, instability of the joint, extreme loss of movement, you're down, and significant pain. <laughs> so hopefully that doesn't happen to you, but it might someday. Now, at the joint, uh, because there's so much friction and there's and there's so much rubbing that's going on between not uh, not just at, at at bones but you have tendons and you have ligaments interacting and so you can get a lot of friction there. There are some pouches of of synovial fluid called bursa. You might be familiar with these bursa. And I, I chose a picture here showing a swollen 
uh, bursa right here in addition to an, an inflamed tendon right here so there's these little fluid filled pouches if you will where they, they cushion an area where tendons and ligaments may potentially rub and so you may know that uh, you have several of these in at the knee joint you can imagine there's a lot of uh, friction there and, and so it's sort of countering that by preventing having these little bags uh, of, of fluid at the joint now you again this is one of these you know bursa people aren't thinking about it normally but in, until there's trouble and then it's like oh my my knee is swelling I, and then you go to the physician and you're like what happened well I, I bumped into someone I collided with something there was some kind of trauma or maybe there's an infection or m maybe I've just been spending the whole day crawling around on my knees and I have knee bursitis if you've heard of that before knee bursitis it's an inflammation a swelling of the bursa of these fluid filled caps and it could be due again to an infection it could be uh, some kind of trauma but it includes pain <laughs> bursitis uh, swelling and warmth and that's what the inflammation is all about and so you if you do need to go into to a physician to attend to this potentially what they could do is aspirate the 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 bursa by draining some of the fluid with with a needle if they they may decide to do that and uh, knee bursitis and that would relieve the swelling and potentially pain as well okay so let's talk a little bit more about this joint capsule or just sort of review some of the things that I've been mentioning. The joint capsule is basically uh, providing stability between bones and, and, it, and it, it's, it's preventing though uh, injury and it's also in some ways limiting the range of motion and, and, and it, that, that's good as well. But basically it's the joint capsule, it's uh, the articulating surfaces of the menisci as I mentioned before for example in the knee there's fat pads and then there's tendons that also help to support the knee. So collectively, all those things are, are coming together at, at the uh, stabilizing the synovial joint. And so here's a nice uh, sagittal section of the knee. Here's the femur and here's the tibia. And you can sort of see the some things that I was just mentioning. Here again are some bursa right there and there and there. And then here's a little fat pad. Okay. Here's the two menisci. Or meniscus for singular right there here's the articular cartilage uh, here's the joint cavity which is then filled by synovial fluid right in here okay so all of that is stabilizing reducing friction and uh, you know again allowing us to put a lot of force uh, at, at this joint and not suffer any injury now it's not to say that injury can't occur. Now, uh, you can have a dislocation. In other words, uh, where the articulating surfaces, the two bones, for example, over here in an elbow dislocation, you can see the humerus is dislocated from the ulna and radius. Okay, so in other words, the articulating surf surfaces are forced apart by some sort of trauma, if you will. Now, that could, that could damage to, to, to a, a degree the articular cartilage, which you can see right there at the end of the bone, to some degree. And it can also, again, we talked about sprains. It can also uh, pull and tear ligaments, and it can also damage the, the joint capsule. This is often uh, dislocations around synovial joints uh, can because they're less, less uh, strong, but they're more mobile. Uh, this can happen at the elbow and then somewhat famously a shoulder dislocation where you can see the head of the of the humerus is actually comes out of the glenoid cavity right here in the scapula that's what that's trouble <laughs> but it can be replaced put back in uh, and then you can have a parcel dis dislocation as well you may have experienced this uh, in, a, in the patella sometimes gets out of whack and it moves laterally back and forth from normal position okay so sublux lux, luxation is what that's called so let's talk a little bit about movement now now uh, it's not per se a different conversation than what we've been having about joints it's it's connected to <laughs> connected to the joint but we're, let's talk about this we're going to talk a little bit about linear uh, mo movement angular uh, movement and rotational movement okay so gliding so when two surfaces glide past each other sort of an example in this little cartoon illustration is two blocks gliding or sliding past each other do you see that an example of that would be in the carpal bones of your wrist 
those could slide past each other in a gliding like motion okay between uh, carpals and also if you will tarsals uh, which are your little bones in the in your foot okay and then angular movement angular movement could be flexion or extension and I, I think you're familiar with these terms these are common terms flexion in other words what's happening here it's an angular motion so it's going from interior to posterior plane and it reduces the angle between elements so if this arm was extended you would notice that it, it would be like in a 180 degree angle but when you when a uh, flexion occurs the flexion draws the forearm closer in other words it decreases the angle right in here and I hope that's clear and then the bicep is contracting uh, this isn't a video about muscles but th these are sort of antagonists meaning that this one's contracting this one's relaxing and then likewise when the triceps causes extension of, of the of the forearm so let's look at some examples of fl flexion if it's not totally clear already it reduces the ankle so you can have flexion of the wrist so in other words it's like this and then you decrease the angle right there flexion of the wrist or extension increases the angle between the elements you can extend your arms in a backward direction so increasing the angle or your extension of the hip are examples of this you can have extension of the wrist or if you you know could you you kind of might anticipate where i'm going with this you can extend the wrist and it's comfortable like this but then you can over extend over extend like for example if you're falling and something is pushing your wrist back and that's known as hyper extension so it's an angular motion um, but it's it, it's past the anatomical position and so injury can occur in a hyper extension maybe you've had a hyper extended uh, wrist before it's not it's not good <laughs> um, so here I, I like this diagram it sort of shows all different motions here flexion and extension and then here's a hyper extension if you go further back here's the hyper extension of the of the leg extension and flexion okay uh, now these are important angular movements as well so you may have heard of these before too these are fairly common abduction to abduct or to sort of take something away it's an angular motion and it, it has to do with moving something away from the medial line of the body so if you're moving your arms away or lifting their arms away it's abduction so it's so it's in the frontal plane but you're moving your uh, moves away from the longitudinal axis in other words it's moving the, the limb away from the medial line of the body here's an example of abduction angular movement so let me go back to that here's the, the sort of that medial line right there in the center so you're moving uh, limbs away you could also have abduction of of the fingers so you're moving away and in this case it's not the medial of the body it's the medial um, uh, finger your phalange right there that you're abducting your fingers away or ad adduct is where we're going with this you can bring the fingers together and so adduction is is a movement toward the midline so if you're bringing your arms downward it's abduction you're going toward the middle okay as an example of that so abduction adduction in terms of angular movement and again uh, adduction right here I always think of abduction as moving the fingers apart from one another sort of like a Vulcan live long and prosper <laughs> one of those okay so you can get abduct adduct abduct adduct <laughs> a lot of fun with that so again a nice diagram you're welcome to pause this and sort of take a look at it but it's it's pretty clear again moving away abduct moving toward the midline of the body is ab abduction okay now circumduction is a, is, is a circular motion uh, with without rotation so an example of that would be for example I'm showing here in a circumduction of the hip where you're swirling your hip around but it could also be moving your your shoulder joint around as well as if you're a um, yeah you have a lasso and you're and you're trying to rope an animal or something like that <laughs> so circumduction okay and then you have other kinds of movements around these synovial joints like sim simple rotations but rotation can be uh, left or right and they could be uh, considered medial rotation 
So again, the anatomical medial, meaning toward the middle or towards the midline, is an inward rotation. So for example, if we're talking about your ankle, it would be moving your foot toward the middle. So you're angling a medial rotation, moving your foot inward, as opposed to lateral rotation, which is an outward rotation. So it rotates a lot from the axis uh, away from the center line. You can see here that the, it's lateral rotation of the, of, of the ankle. Likewise, you can have uh, head rotation, you can have left rotation and right rotation. Okay? And medial, meaning internal rotation, lateral towards the outside rotation. Uh, now, other kinds of, of rotations, again, you may have heard of these terms before, uh, pronation. Okay, an example of uh, pronation is, for example, in the forearm. When the, the forearm uh, rotates such that the radius, which is, again, in the anatomical position, your radius is lateral. So your radius would then roll over the ulna. And so the palm would be facing downward or pronate or, if you will, posterior. Okay, so pronation as opposed to... Okay, here's pronation. So again, a rotation uh, where the palms are facing downward or supernation, supernate, to lift the palms up. And again, a way to remember that is there's different ways to remember lots of things in anatomy and physiology, but supernation, to me, this one seems pretty straightforward, like you're holding a bowl of soup. Okay, so supernation. So the forearm is an anatomical palms facing up like that, supernate. Supernate, pronate, supernate. Okay, so supernate, palms looking forward. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Now, this can occur not just at in the forearm, this can occur in, in, uh, in the ankle as well, in the lower leg. And uh, this is of consideration sometimes when people are purchasing uh, different types of athletic shoes. Like, for example, if, they're, if, they're, if you're a runner and you're, in, and you're uh, a supernator or pronator, um, sometimes the a person at the shoe store might help to guide you in particular brands of shoes that have more padding on uh, laterally or medially, depending on how you're uh, how you land when you're running. So supernate and pronate. Uh, there's also special movements of inversion where you're sort of twisting the sole of your foot medially so that the sole of the foot points toward the other one. So this is called inversion as opposed to uh, uh, eversion, which is again twisting laterally, so it's rotating the ankle so that the sole points away from the other. So, inversion, uh, inversion, and uh, eversion. Okay, and that's an example of that. So you're you're going in, you're going out with the ankle. Now, those dorsal flexion, in other words, lifting your to toes up, dorsiflexion. So it's decreasing the angle of the of the ankle joint. You're decreasing right over here, decreasing the angle, lifting your toes up, as opposed to plantar flexion, which is uh, increasing this angle right there, pointing your toes. Again, I, I, you know, whether or not this is, this is important to you, it's a matter of, you know, if you're finding yourself, you know, it, it's very important if you're an orthopedic uh, physician, you know, when your people are coming in with different injuries and you're trying to make diagnosis and you're trying to, you know, come to the to some conclusions. And or if you're, I, I was mentioning before, if you're a runner and, and if you're a gymnast, you know, these are things that are that are uh, particularly important and that are in, uh, th that you'll want to consider. So it's all relative. So dorsiflexion and then plantar flexion right there are examples of that. Now. Uh, there are some special movements that I wanted to point out with, with revolt, which involves the thumb. You may know that the thumb is, is uh, important in terms of flexion of the thumb, okay, as opposed to abduction of the thumb or adduction of the thumb or extension of the thumb. Okay, you have all of these possibilities. And then this particular motion is a, is, is a good one. It helps our hands to be able to grasp and, and the importance of grasping. I, I don't want to over get excited about this, but the importance of grasping is huge in terms of evolutionary um, adaptation in terms of taking humans to places, uh, tool use, etc. And so what you got here is this sort of thumb movement, uh, opposition it's referred to as where it's thumb movement of 
sort of the fingers coming together, like for example, grasping something. So the thumb is coming across and touching the finger off position. And then finally you have uh, the, sort of this, these types of special movements like moving anteriorly uh, in the horizontal plane. So in other words, pushing forward with the shoulders and then as opposed to retraction or pulling back with sort of this posterior movement toward the back. And then you have elevation, which lifts the shoulders up in a, in a superior direction and then elevation and then, oh, depression. In other words, moving to an inferior or downward movement. And then you have lateral flexion where you bend, you're bending the, the ver vertebral column from side to side from the center. So you can go left or right from the medial line. So there's an example of lateral flexion. So all kinds of motion. I find that, that kind of interesting personally. So let's finish this conversation about uh, uh, types of joints by looking at uh, some interesting functions of these synovial joints. They can do different things like there's gliding and hinge, pivotal, con chondral, saddle and ball and socket. Okay, let's take a look at these. So the gliding one, uh, you're like, whoa, this sounds familiar. I've mentioned this one before. The gliding joint between, for example, the carpals right over here, it's, it's flattened or slightly curved bases right in here, and it's limited motion, if you will. Uh, again, uh, an example of the gliding motion is uh, right here in the carpals, but another example would be, for example, the, the clavicle when it articulates with the manubrium of the sternum is an example right here of a gliding joint. Okay, slightly uh, non-axial or multi-axial movement right in here, gliding joints. Okay, there's flat and they move back and forth. All right. Then hinge joint, a classic example of this. And again, you, I, you might already know this, the hinge of your elbow, okay, uh, causing the flexion as we were talking about before. So it's, a, it, it's an angular motion in the single plane, monoaxial. And you can see here is a sort of a diagram of what that might look like when the humerus articulates um, with the ulna in a hinge joint, okay? Uh, as you can see here is a hinge joint right there, elbow. The, the knee is also an example of a, of a hinge joint. Uh, these chondral joints are pretty important. They allow, they're like, for example, between uh, the, the fingers here in terms of your metacarpals and your phalanges. So right here, metacarpal and, and uh, proximal phalanges right in here. So chondral joints, uh, if they're usually sort of oval uh, articular face with a depression and it allows uh, the fingers to be able to clench and also like form up into a ball which is very useful and then these chondral joints uh, an example of this would be um, here again uh, the radius and ulna interacting with one another all right right in this area And then another type of joint is the saddle joint. The saddle joint is what was allow allowing that opposition movement. In other words, where the thumb is moving toward the other fingers. All right, and right here, it sort of looks like a saddle, if you will, like where somebody's sitting on, on in, in the saddle right here. And it's, and it's, it's where they're, you know, too concave straddled and it's biaxial as well, right in here. So it's allowing oppositions, an example of a, a saddle joint. Okay, and then again, a, a nice diagram of that. And then a, a pivot joint. Uh, a pivot joint would allow the, the uh, when we were talking earlier about the uh, supernate or pronate right here along the elbow, right in here. So it allows for the pronation, in other words, the pivoting rotation move in the elbow joint, allowing this kind of interaction to occur between the radius and ulna. You see that right there? A pivot joint. Another example, really important example of a pivot joint going around like that is again that, you know, that no motion of, of your, your skull <laughs> around as it articulates with the number one and number two um, cer cervical uh, vertebrae. And again, you might be familiar with this. 
in the dens and how there's an example of a pivot joint right over here, rotation. And then finally uh, is the ball and socket. And, and I mentioned this before in the acetabulum right over here in the, the head of the femur, ball and socket. So here's where we have a lot of uh, motion. And so we have a lot of mo mobility, a lot of freedom. And also an example of this would be in the shoulder uh, where the humerus articulates with the scapula. Uh, but again, though there's tremendous amount of motion and ability in the ball and socket joint, in the shoulder and in the hip are examples of the ball and socket. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons. The greater the mobility, again, the weaker the joint. And so you can have some dislocations if you're not careful. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, um, following that and uh, learning about the different functions and roles of joints and articulations. Thanks for watching.